And I went back to the very beginning um, when Clark Johnson and uh, Bob Schumacher walked into Twin City Lines offices and said, can you give us a streetcar? And they gave them 1300. And so they moved 1300 out of Snelling and over to the Montgomery Ward next door onto the one of the railroad sidings. And I don't know if it was Milwaukee Road or if it was uh, uh, Montgomery Ward, but they said, you got to get it out of there. So they did this. This is the coupling, in case you haven't seen this picture before. They put a freight car on either end of it. They ran an airline through. And this is not exactly um, standard coupling uh, here, but that's what they did. And off it went. This, by the way, is the little industrial spur that used to go up to Snelling Shops and Wards Midway. Um, if you would be out on the you would be out on the bridge over I ninety four in later years with the car crossing Concordia Avenue, but uh, they took this thing to Hopkins. Here it is arriving out at the Hopkins Depot, um, and the, there's Bill Olson, you know, at it uh, out in Hopkins, and of course it sat there for eight years and so was starting to deteriorate. And that was the origin of our museum. And so uh, they arranged to put it into uh, the Minnesota Transfer Roundhouse. And I'm going to just close this little thing here. Um, and so uh, this is when my dad got involved. And I remember him saying in particular, I'm not sure I'm going to put too much time into this. Uh, and then that led to 40 some years of volunteering. But as you can see, they went, they replaced a, a little rotted wainscoting. They put on a new canvas roof. Uh, they rigged up the goat here uh, with the trolley bus motor and uh, the engine. And this was the very first year. And they incorporated the Minnesota Transportation Museum. And uh, this, it's the logo from the old Minneapolis Threshing Machine Company because it was right out in Hopkins next to that. And the, the, the letters worked out. And Paul Joyce, was our PR guy, and he lived in Hopkins. He was a he was a, a marketing guy for Super Value, and um, he uh, our first PO box was PO box thirteen hundred in Hopkins. So anyway, uh, they got her all painted up there and had the new roof on it. Here it is on the turntable, and so uh, the next year here they decided to go and uh, run out in the yard. Now, what's interesting is. Both of these pieces have been uh, kept. Uh, Locomotive 200 is at the Illinois Railway Museum now. But you can see the railroad yard. We just ran down there a quarter mile and back. And of course, this is what happened. And uh, it's even better than this. Check that out. Um, and I was out there and what I remember, I was 13 years old and I remember everybody kind of looking at each other and saying, what in the world have we tapped into here? I guess we need to become an operating museum. So all through the 1960s, they were looking for sites uh, to operate. And they looked at Coa Park and they looked at the state fairgrounds and they looked at the Rosemont uh, uh, Munitions Depot and they looked at the uh, recently abandoned Chicago Great Westerns from Red Wing down to Sombroda. None of those things worked out. And then Paul Joyce finally said, uh, well, you know, there's the old streetcar right away uh, by Lake Harriet. Maybe we should approach the park board. So, of course, we approached the park board in 1969 and signed a lease with them for property that they did not own. It turned out it was owned by the city. We would continue to lease it. Uh, we would continue to erroneously lease this from the park board until 2005 when we did the T21 rebuild of the whole line and we discovered that the city actually owned it. Oh, well. So I uh, put, put little signs out, here we come. And I built the very first car house. And uh, my dad was pretty much the brain trust uh, behind doing that. And he said, look, we're putting a railroad in a really high amenity neighborhood. We have to be as unobtrusive as possible. And so that was the reason for putting it under the bridge. And they laid the track by hand down to 42nd Street and across 42nd. And they got this far, just past uh, the depot, and put 1300 on a truck and brought it on over. And of course, you saw this in the Twin City Lines. This is the inaugural run. And uh, for two years, we ran it with uh, just with the goat, no overhead wire. Um, eventually got the siding in, although the siding didn't get overhead wire initially. It took a little while. And so, um, in 73, the overhead, well, by 73, they, 
Actually, sorry, it was 1972. They built up to the Berry Road Bridge. This is uh, how far it went. And here you can see the cemetery fence going across to take over the right of way north of the Berry Road Bridge, which is why we make a turn. So then in 73, the overhead wire went up. And then in 77 came the big push uh, up to uh, Lake Calhoun. Here we are going around the Archer Range curve. And then, of course, so uh, we're all the way up to our, our ending point. Right. Frank Sandberg uh, negotiated the agreement with the uh, cemetery board not to obstruct any any views of Lake Calhoun from the uh, from the cemetery. I wasn't aware of that. Thank the, you. Uh, the dearly departed would have been very offended if their view of the lake had been interrupted. So that's right. why we stopped a block short of 36th Street. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we thought we need another streetcar. So here is 265 in its original form. And um, somewhere in there, we uh, rented this unheated wood shop building in the rear of the Northern Pacific, well, the, by then Burlington Northern Como Shops. And that became our restoration shop. And that's where 265 was restored. That's where uh, Locomotive 328 and the Dan Patch were restored. And so here's 265 inside the Como shops, cold as hell in the wintertime, but everybody worked through the winter. I, if I recall, Bill, we went and uh, put kind of a, a little heated zone inside the car. Well, yeah, they wrapped the whole car in plastic. Okay. And, uh, and then put a, a propane heater inside and it was very comfortable. All right. And there's, uh, that is one of the steeple cab trucks, I believe, that we took the motors out of. Yep. Okay. And yep. so then, of course, we have 265. Now, we only had a single car barn, so we had to go and build the shop. And so the order of it, you're going to see the order. As we, every time we added a car, we had to add a piece to the car barn. Hey. So the shop got built first. And then, of course, so car 78. And there was a fair amount of debate as to whether or not it was even worth trying. Um, and then Bill Olson went and bought the, uh, the Brill power truck from uh, Belgium, and that was the impetus to make it happen. So, of course, 78 got done. I'm really glossing over a lot of stuff here. And when that happened, we needed the third, so we built the Ready Barn. And so then we decided we wanted a depot, and we had this picture. And it was actually after this, it was 2006 that I put the signs in, but I just thought I'll do double duty here and show you that. And uh, the depot was, des was designed by, by the late Gene Hickey, who was one of our uh, members who was, a, uh, uh, who was an architect. Um, he, uh, he modeled uh, Colorado narrow gauge. Did you ever own his basement, Bill? Yeah. And uh, he had that enormous rocks put in his basement that served as mountains. So when he died, I always wondered how they got the rocks out of his basement. But anyway, he, he passed away in the middle of the construction of this, and Norm Potus oversaw the, uh, the rest of it. Go back to the previous slide. Uh, the, he said, I, I didn't have any drawings of the building. And he said, I looked at that man standing there with a little boy, and I decided that that man was five feet, 10 inches tall. And he scaled all the rest of the building off that man who he was pretty sure was five feet, 10 inches tall. So we got, we got that done. And then along came the PCCs. And uh, there's dad there. And we, dad had been trying to get these two PCCs that had been uh, transferred from Newark to Cleveland in 1978 and were used a couple of years and then were sitting. And the reason we wanted them is that they had the original seats in there, whereas the other, the newer PCCs had, had new seats and other modifications. So um, Dad was trying to get it. And Ed Allen, who had been at Iowa Traction and then became the chief mechanical officer for the Shaker Heights operation uh, uh, in uh, Cleveland, Ed was just stubborn, didn't want to give the cars away. Um, and so finally, um, a couple of us went uh, who worked at Metro Transit 
went to our general manager and said, can you go talk to Cleveland and get these federally funded assets transferred to Metro Transit so and then give them to us? And he said, sure. And uh, that's how we got the PCC card. I haven't seen you for a long time. Long time and you're here. Who's talking? Okay. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't talk. Don't talk. Don't talk. I'm so, sorry. So, so anyway, um, we were able to negotiate putting the PCC car in the overhaul base uh, for the first five years. And that's how Holly Melko got involved because it was right next to the body shop. Uh, we had only had experience with wood cars, not steel cars. And Howie and a couple of the other of the body shop guys uh, showed us how to do it. And uh, we uh, that's that's where Howie came from. And so we got her all stripped down. And then when it came time to paint, we just hired Metro Transit. I mean, they had a state-of-the-art paint booth to paint it. And of course, there she is. And uh, therefore, we needed more car bar in space. So uh, we got a federal T21 grant, which my dad administered, and we put the extension on the front and we put the connector on the back. And dad said after that, I'm never doing another one of those. Um, and then of course we had gotten two PCC cars and uh, the other one, number 27, uh, which is uh, Twin Cities 416 was stored over at Jackson Street. And we went and swapped that to, uh, Shoreline Trolley Museum in New Haven for some parts of some kind. So anyway, in 2004, <clears throat> the, uh, the light rail was built. Now this of course was the last trip and out at the Brookside Loop. And uh, as the Minnesota Rail Fans Association liked to do, they had somebody with kind of a broad view camera and they would take a picture. Um, and there's, some, there's a number of uh, of our people here, I know Fred Rhodes is in this one somewhere, and here's Bill Cordes. Oh goodness! Uh, anyway, there were a number of uh, people who became our members uh, in this, and so because it was 50 years almost to the month, as a matter of fact, it was to the month um, that they were building the new light rail. I went to the rail office and I said, "Could we go and run a 50-year excursion before you open uh, the Hiawatha line?" Uh, to celebrate, and that's what we did. And we had a fair number of people who were on, I had a dozen people from that 54 trip who were on this. And I actually went to the Fort Snelling station and I printed out, I, I, I bought a fare and I printed out a ticket prior to the start of uh, regular operations. Aaron, can you go back to the, uh, to the 1954 one? Uh, just on the far, far left, over here is Ray Benson Sr. There's Ray Benson. Here's Bob. Uh, there's uh, Bob McNee is here. Bob McNee is there. And uh, I forget what what is. Dave, is that Dave Norman? Oh, Dave Norman's in there somewhere. I, uh, I'm not quite sure. Okay, here's Norm Potus. There's Bill Olson. Yeah. Uh, there's Bob Schumacher, I think. Yep. I mean, a bunch of guys who became our members. Um, Okay. Yeah. And so uh, it was 2004, 2005 when we split off and came to the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. And of course, that was right smack in the middle of the big T21 project to completely rebuild the Como Harriet line down to the dirt. And uh, the local share, uh, the city of Minneapolis, was running the project. That, that was how these federal grants were uh, designed. And <clears throat> there had to be a local share. And so the inclined local share was to <clears throat> rebuild the pedestrian underpass and rebuild the concrete work at Cottage City and rebuild these railings up here. And uh, Mike Monahan from the city uh, shepherded that project. And so you can see there's actually hidden under here, there's another one of the lamppost bases. All the lamppost bases, you can see the conduit down into them. This one had a tree wrapped around it. And so, of course, we got them all rebuilt. And Leo Malash, for some reason, had uh, had acquired these lamp posts um, for something out of, out at Excelsior, and never used them. And we had them, so it's like nobody had ever seen a picture of what these lamp posts look like. So we just put them in there, and they look appropriate. Okay. And then, of course, in 2015, we went and did the addition which included the Russell Olson Library. 
Now we're going to go over to Excelsior. And uh, you can see it's 1994 on this thing. And um, Leo Malash uh, got a, uh, and Dumas got a hold of the body of 1809 that was a cabin. And they did a, uh, they did a, a cosmetic restoration and put some seats in about half of it and set it, put a little length of track here right in front of the Excelsior Museum and uh, put it out here for people to see. As you can see, it says Streetcar Steamboat Division. And then they started building the line. And of course, the original idea was to go past Excelsior Boulevard about two or three car lengths. And um, where Leo had negotiated, he, he had gotten the dock built, the home dock built for the Minnehaha, and he had negotiated some kind of an easement where you could walk through from here to there. And that's the part of the Excelsior line that never happened. The other part that never happened is later he got a second T21 grant to complete a loop um, where you go down Water Street, down Lake Avenue, and you'd have a complete circle. The pro two problems. First, the grant was woefully short of what it would have taken to do that. Second, uh, the businesses uh, and the city council really didn't want a streetcar running down the middle of, uh, of Water Street. So it didn't happen. And so uh, here's the track being laid before the car barn was put in. You, you can see the kind of funny kink here in track one. And as we all know, they measured it a little bit wrong. Here's the car barn going up. And I, I think that might be Leo right there. I don't know. Yeah, that's Leo. Yeah. And here it is, not painted yet, but getting pretty close to done. Yeah, I have to get these. And uh, here's the track at the other end looking pretty new. And so, of course, when they started, they didn't have, it was still a steamboat operation. They didn't have any streetcars. So Leo went and bought these two cars, uh, these little gas cars from Valley Fair. And uh, the, sh the, the shop crew went and, had, you know, painted them up and kind of fixed them up and they worked. And uh, the steamboat guy said, you know, we really don't care anything about this trolley line. And he went to the trolley guys and said, would you be willing to take it? And... We did kind of a cost benefit study and determined that at the time it was at least a break even operation. So we thought it won't put us in the hole, we'll do it. Um, and so we went and sold both of these to the uh, dinner train out in Stillwater uh, and put car 78 out there. By the way, look, look at the trolley pole on 78, something went wrong there. So anyway, the next project was car 1239. And I just, I love this picture of Ken Albrecht and for the life of me to this day, I do not know how he managed to physically make the, the, the steel grid steps work. Yeah, but, but every curve had a different radius than the previous curve, and yet somehow he got them to line up. I, I'm not, I've never known how, he's, how he did that. So anyway, 1239 got done. And then, of course, came along one on a 10, which uh, needed a new underframe and, of course, uh, had to be straightened out because it wasn't square anymore. And uh, the saga of the power truck, this is where the power truck came from. This is Lancaster Street Railway number six, which as you can see was built as a horse car. And in 1894, I guess they, they, they didn't have any money. So they converted it to an electric car and they bought this truck to put under it. Um, and then uh, when the, the Lancaster street cars quit in what I think was 1936, um, the folks who owned it kept two of them. And put them in a put them in a shed, and they were there till oh about the 1970s or so when the Ohio uh, Historical Society discovered them, acquired them, and took car six and backdated it to a uh, horse car, which meant the truck was surplus and the truck went to Trolleyville, which was the Trolley Museum up in a uh, up in a trailer park outside of Cleveland. And Trolleyville went out of business and tried in 190, in 2007 or something like that, and tried to um, a re, have a rebirth as the Lakeshore Electric uh, Trolley Museum. But the Great Recession was on and it didn't work. And this was the only DuPont truck unattached anywhere in North America. And so we bought it. And I think that's just a remarkable coincidence that that all happened at that time. And here it is under the car. Now, of course, it's still trouble, but uh, here, here's number 10. And here, of course, is the lineup. I'm getting to the end here. 
Now, um, the museum, of course, does more than just run the streetcars and restore them. Uh, in 1976, Russ Olson put out Electric Railways of Minnesota, the Bible, if you will, followed in 1991 by, a, by an addendum, and Russ has just kept on uh, working, doing research. And then, of course, I followed with uh, uh, Twin Ports by Trolley, Twin Cities by Trolley, and Twin Cities Trolleys in Color. And we have Twin City Lines, and I'm up to 1,500 pages worth of history in Twin City Lines. And then, of course, we wanted to share this stuff. So uh, this is a page from the Minnesota Digital Library where we have our 2,500 photos. And then, of course, um, our uh, YouTube page. And then for future projects, here's uh, number 28 for Fargo-Moorhead. And number 10. And then, of course, uh, all we've got left out there for maybe a future project is number 303. This is 304 up in Duluth, built by Twin City Lines in 1925. And then, of course, here's 303 in the cabin. Someday we'll maybe be able to make contact with the cabin owner and figure out what we want to do, if anything. And then, of course, here's the 50th anniversary crowd at Lake Harriet. And that is it.